Good day, everyone. On behalf of Cambridge Health Tech Institute's Global Web Symposia Series and our sponsor, Unchained Labs, I'd like to welcome you to Thermal Unfolding and Aggregation Analysis of Lead Antibodies and Variants Derived from Synthetic Antibody Libraries. My name is Elizabeth Lamb, and I'm the host and moderator for today's event. Now I'd like to introduce our presenters for today. First is Dr. Kevin Lance, PhD, Marketing Manager for UNCLE with Unchained Labs. Our second speaker is Dr. Aaron K. Sato, PhD, Chief Scientific Officer, Biopharma, with Twist Biopharma, a division of Twist Bioscience. Welcome, Drs. Lance and Sato. The presenter ball is yours. Thanks for that introduction. I'll be introducing and giving some background to the thermal unfolding and aggregation analysis part of this webinar and the instrument used for much of the analysis. When dealing with a library of options, picking out just one option can leave you feeling a bit like the statue on the left, overwhelmed. In this webinar, myself and Aaron will talk about antibody libraries and how to use the uncle from Unchained Labs in a workflow to screen a library down to just the best performing options. When thinking about the stability of a protein, we can summarize it as two different options, conformational and colloidal. Conformational stability, shown in the blue on the left, is the ability of a protein to stay folded in its native state. Thankfully, examining a protein's fluorescence is one way to gain insight into the conformational stability of that protein and is an easy way to examine thermally induced unfolding during a heat ramp. Colloidal stability, shown on the right and green, can be thought of as the aggregation behavior of a protein. Gathering size information from static and dynamic light scattering can inform the understanding of a protein's colloidal stability. Both of these behaviors combine to paint a fuller picture of a protein's stability. So that leads us to the uncle and its ability to gather conformational and colloidal information to paint a fuller picture of protein stability. UNCLE is an all-in-one multimodal biologic stability platform that combines three detection methods in 12 applications to help you understand the stability and aggregation behavior of your proteins. To test any of these applications, only nine microliters of sample is needed and up to 48 samples can be run at once. Those three detection methods are full spectrum fluorescence, static light scattering or SLS, and dynamic light scattering or DLS. UNCLE can see the full spectrum for fluorescence to give you the option to look at protein intrinsic fluorescence and evaluate tyrosine and tryptophan fluorescence, or use any of an arsenal of fluorescent dyes. Simultaneous with that fluorescence experiment, you can use static light scattering to monitor how the same sample aggregates. UNCLE uses SLS at two wavelengths so you can track small and large particles at the same time. Dynamic light scattering, or DLS, is UNCLE's third detection method, and it is a highly sensitive technique to give you details about your protein's size and size distribution. Besides gathering size data, DLS is also powerful for understanding what's in your sample and can be used to quality check proteins before you start an experiment or after an experiment to get orthogonal confirmation of SLS data on aggregation. Lastly, UNCLE also combines temperature control with these three detection methods, so you can run samples at room temperature, elevated stable temperature, or across any of a variety of heat ramps and understand how your proteins unfold and change in response to stress. Here's a look at how our three detection methods enable UNCLE's applications. By using all three detection methods in unique ways, UNCLE can give insight into protein stability not available by using one or even two of these methods alone. For example, there's an application for melting temperature in the first row of the table. With full spectrum fluorescence, you can monitor the unfolding of proteins by looking at the intrinsic fluorescence from the aromatic residues in your protein, mainly tryptophan. When a thermal ramp is applied, the heat stress causes the protein to unfold and its fluorescence signal changes. From this type of experiment, you can get a melting temperature which marks that protein's transition from folded to unfolded. Simultaneous with that fluorescence measurement, you can use static light scattering to monitor how the same sample aggregates over that same thermal ramp and mark the temperature of aggregation onset as a protein's TAG, as seen in the table's second row. Later, 
Aaron will show how Twist uses this TM and TAG application to help screen through many different antibody constructs and understand which ones are the most stable and sh should move forward with development. For the uncle, dynamic light scattering also uncovers a protein's size and polydispersity, and DLS or SLS can look at nonspecific self-interactions with B22, T22, and KD. So in short, this table of applications shows all the way UNCLE gives insight into a protein's stability and aggregation behavior. Now allow me to introduce one of the key features of the UNCLE, which is the UNI sample holder. The UNI is composed of an array of 16 quartz cuvettes that are easily loaded with a pipette. The high-grade quartz gets us great optical sensitivity for fluorescence and light scattering data, and the frame is an anodized aluminum that provides efficient heat transfer. The 16 samples are loaded into the uni and then are sealed in a blue frame with a silicone seal so you know that evaporation won't be a problem during a heat ramp. Over a heat ramp, UNCLE will excite and read the full spectrum fluorescence of a protein sample at numerous temperatures. Each line in this graph is a fluorescence read of a protein excited with a 266 nanometer laser, starting with the read at 15 degrees C and going all the way to 95 degrees. You can see by following the curves from top to bottom how they shift to the right side of the graph, which are the longer wavelengths. This phenomenon is called a red shift and occurs because the protein is unfolding. Buried tryptophan residues have a shifting fluorescence emission as they move from being buried in hydrophobic pockets to being exposed to an aqueous environment. This protein shows a classic red shift pattern, but you never know how each protein will behave until you've tried it. Some proteins shift to the left, called a blue shift, while others can decrease in fluorescence without a shift. With this way of collecting full-spectrum fluorescence, you have all the data and don't need to worry about unexpected protein behaviors. For proteins without tryptophan, UNCLE also has a 473 nanometer laser that can be used as cypro-orange dye to excite fluorescence and determine unfolding. The analysis method we recommend reports the barycentric mean, or BCM, shown on the left. This is the wavelength that evenly divides the area under the curve as a kind of spectral center of mass. We found that this analysis method is the least susceptible to noise since it integrates a large range of the fluorescence spectrum. Analysis of a protein's fluorescence shows unfolding and identifies the inflection points as melting temperatures. UNCLE delivers on this fluorescence data simultaneously with gathering SLS data to get protein thermal stability and aggregation information in just a single experiment. Here we're looking at the results of a thermal ramp experiment where protein fluorescence is being tracked in blue and SLS is in green. Fluorescence shows your proteins unfolding and quantifies that with melting temperatures at TM1 and TM2. The SLS data in green shows the aggregation behavior of your protein and reports the temperature when aggregation begins as TAG. Notice how the TAG event lines up with TM2, linking the second unfolding event to aggregation of the protein. Together, the two protein tools of intrinsic fluorescence and SLS give you an understanding of how unfolding and aggregation is occurring in response to thermal stress. Dynamic light scattering, or DLS, is UNCLE's third detection method, and it is a highly sensitive technique to give you data on your protein's size and size distribution. Here we're looking at some example data of a monomeric sample in blue, a sample with some aggregation in green, and a sample with significant aggregation in yellow. I want to point out that the x-axis is shown in a log scale. The metrics that are reported from DLS data are the z-average diameter, which is a weighted average of diameter, and a polydispersity index value, or PDI, which is a measure of the width of the size distribution. Looking left to right across the slide at these samples, we see an increasing trend in the z-average diameter, which agrees with what we know about the sample state. Likewise, the size distributions for these samples widen as you look left to right. Since higher PDI values indicate wider size distributions, PDI would also show an increasing trend here. So that's a little bit about the UNCLE and an introduction to how it can use these tools to get you from a multitude of choices to finding the one option out of a whole library that you really, really want. And now Aaron's going to talk a little bit more about Twist Biopharma and how they use their process and the UNCLE to get stable, strongly binding antibodies. 
Thanks, Kevin, for that great introduction to the Uncle platform and how you can use that technology for actually interrogating antibody leads within a discovery workflow. Today, I'm going to be introducing the Twist BioPharma vertical, which is a group within Twist Bioscience that is focused on utilizing their DNA platform for helping pharma and biotech discover as well as optimize antibody leads. I always say the best companies out there really understand the one thing that they're really good at. And for Twist, um, that's our ability to print large numbers of individual all goes up to 300 base pairs in length um, on this silicon surface shown on the right. So on this surface, we can actually print up to a million different individual oligos, and we can use those pools of oligos to create all kinds of different DNA products that twist cells. The first and foremost are custom clonal genes that we can clone into any vector, but we also can use these pools of oligos to encode and produce high-quality DNA libraries. So how do we do that? If you think of about an antibody domain, like for example, a heavy chain or a light chain domain, it's basically a collection of three different loops or CDR loops. We can basically make pools of oligos and encode for the diversity in those loops and then stitch them together seamlessly to create a hypervariable domain. So again, the reason why this is unprecedented compared to how others have done this in the past is that in the past people have used degenerate oligos, which are again either mixtures of nucleotides or trinucleotides to encode for diversity in these loops, which can oftentimes lead to mistakes or unnatural sequences that may not be in the natural human repertoire. Here, because like, I'm actually synthesizing each sequence explicitly, I can make sure that those sequences have matched, exactly match what's seen in nature. In addition, I can remove sequences up front that might lead to liabilities in the antibody sequence. So for, for example, isomerization sites, cleavage sites, deamidation sites, maybe even glycosylation sites. And then third, I can even do fancy things like encode for specific motifs in those sequences if I choose to, and it actually enables me to go after some difficult targets that I'll talk about later. So as I mentioned, Twist Biopharma is a vertical within Twist Bioscience. We're focused on creating a proprietary technology using Twist platform and then utilizing that technology to help pharma and biotech discover and optimize antibodies. So shown here on this slide is just a breakdown of all the different areas that we're focused on. So first, creating a whole panel of libraries, mostly human antibody phage display libraries that can be utilized for helping um, pharma and biotech again to discover antibodies to very difficult targets. The second area we're focused on is that we're creating fully human synthetic libraries that can be used to drug um, very difficult targets, for example, G protein coupled receptors, which is one of the largest validated classes of targets in pharma and biotech today. Third, we've created a software system coupled with our DNA library technology that we can utilize to help others optimize antibodies for greater potency as well as developability. And then finally, we're coupling twist clonal DNA technology to basically take that one step forward and enable farm biotechnology to not only order antibody genes, but also the actual antibody protein that's encoded by those genes. So looking ahead to the future, Twist Biopharma basically hope to have a library of libraries. So basically because we can build libraries so quickly and so readily, we plan to have a whole panel of different antibody phage display libraries that we can use to interrogate any target that might come our way. And again, because the reason why we can do this is because we can build libraries um, so quickly and so readily compared to others out there in the industry. So one of the types of libraries that we've built are single domain libraries or VHH libraries. Single domain libraries are really helpful in building bispecific antibodies, for example, because they're very small and modular and they can be used to attach on to other antibody sequences. They're very stable and robust. They retain full antigen binding capacity, much like a full length antibody, but they're very easy to engineer and manufacture. And oftentimes, because of their smaller nature, they're, they're, they're able to access ep epitopes that might be sterically hindered by a larger IgG framework. And because, again, we're using synthetic libraries, we might be able to get to sequences that bind specific targets and epitopes much, much faster 
the immunization approaches. So again, taking that a step forward, we've actually created three different single domain libraries, which we call the VHH Ratio Library, the VHH Shuffle Library, and the VHH Human Shuffle Library. So what we did, again, similar to many of our other libraries that we've created, is we, we basically found a whole database of uh, VHH LAMA sequences, and we utilized those sequences to basically design the three libraries that are shown here. So for the VHH Ratio Library, we created pools of oligos that mimic the diversity seen in CDRs 1, 2, and 3 of, of those sequences. And then we graphed them into a LAMA-based framework to give us our first VHH single domain library. For the VHH shuffle library, we just took the natural LAMA CDR sequences derived from those VHH antibodies and then just shuffled them in different combinations in the same LAMA consensus framework. And then in the third library, we did the same thing, but instead of using a LAMA consensus framework, we used a fully humanized VHH framework. And for all of these libraries, we transform them on the level of 10 billion different sequences. So to, again, prove out these libraries and show the value of the things that come out of them, we, we then panned all three of them against the same target, which in this case is TIGIT. TIGIT is an immunal oncology target. It's much like PD-1 in that it's a negative regulator of T cell response. And so if you can block this receptor and block its natural ligand, you might be able to upregulate the immune response against cancer. And so that's exactly what we tried to do. We basically panned the libraries against TIGIT in the hopes that we would find antibody antagonists that would block the natural TIGIT CD155 receptor ligand interaction. So taking these three libraries, we panned them all uh, against TIGIT and we came up with a range of uh, basically upwards of 50 different unique anti VHH antibodies from each library to TIGIT. And then we compared those sequences to one another to see the diversity of sequences that came out. And what we found is that from all three libraries, we saw on the bottom a really nice length distribution for, heavy, for the CDR3 sequences. In addition, on the right, you can see that we saw well, a broad range of different affinities from double-digit nanomolar all the way to triple-digit nanomolar with, again, a nice distribution of all three libraries in each different affinity bin. We went on and actually made large numbers of these VHH sequences fused to FC. We expressed and purified them. So shown here is just some, some data in terms of their overall expression as well as their purity. And so as part of our workflow, once we've expressed and purified these antibodies, we want to now interrogate them. I've just told you about one piece of data that we already have generated, which is affinity. But we also want to assess the developability of these leads as well. And one way we do that is that we use the Unchained Uncle platform to look at the stability of these antibodies as well. So shown here is just some of the um, TM measurements that we calculated in the table shown on the left, showing the, the broad range of different thermal unmelting of the VHH domain as it's coupled to FC that was measured using the Unchained platform. And then on this slide, again, we're just, it's just showing some example data, again, from a, using a VHH FC using the uncle. And again, as uh, Kevin showed earlier, we can use the platform to basically not only determine the melting temperature of the VHH domain as well as the FC domain, we can also use it to assess the temperature at which the protein aggregates. And so you can see that, the, again, the, the VHH domain for this particular example melts around 67 degrees, and right around that same temperature, the uh, antibody protein also tends to aggregate. We've gone on to use this data to actually compile and see how the aggregation TMs correlated with the first thermal uh, temperature of, of unfolding, or the TM for the VHH domain really to see if how the framework played a role in the overall stability of these antibodies. And so in general, in the green circles, you can see the effect of the consensus LAMA framework in the first two libraries, and in the, in the yellow is the consensus, is the, is, the cons is the fully humanized framework that we used for the, the final uh, human H shuffle library. In general, what you can see is that there's really no strict correlation between the framework and overall stability for both 
types of libraries, we see a wide range of different thermal stabilities as well as temperatures of aggregation. And so it really tells us that the CDR sequences them themselves actually played a major role and dictated the overall um, stability of these leads. We've gone further and actually looked again and ranked all the sequences on the left um, based on their KD, just to really see if there was a, one particular library that had the highest affinity clones. And in general, we see a nice uh, broad distribution of high affinity clones from all three libraries. And again, utilizing all this data, affinity data, thermal uh, TM, stability data, as well as the aggregation data, we can use all of this data to really assess what leads we want to move ahead. And in general, we find lots of leads that have high affinity, good high uh, thermal stability, as well as high uh, thermal uh, aggregation propensity as well. Another thing that we did is we also wanted to assess the thermal stability of the VHH on its own as it compared to the VHH coupled to FC. And so shown here, we actually expressed and purified both forms of the protein and compared their thermal stability. And in general, we see a really nice correlation between the thermal stability of the VHH coupled to FC versus the VHH um, as it's expressed without the FC. We don't, and we don't see a huge change in the thermal stability as it's coupled to FC. And then finally, we've gone on to actually do some blocking assays to see which one of these VHHs actually blocked the natural TIGIT CD155 interaction. And we basically see that, again, many of the clones from all three different libraries show nice blocking of the TIGIT CD155 interaction. So again, at the end of the day, we can use all this data, affinity, blocking data, coupled with the thermal stability data to really assess and determine which leads we want to move ahead. So just to summarize, um, we can take a very high quality, highly diverse library on the order of 10 billion different antibodies. We can pan that library against um, any target we wish. And so in this case, we pan it against TIGIT and we can come up with a large number of ELISA positive binders. From that, we can actually synthesize and express those proteins and get affinity data against, um, in this case, TIGIT for all of our binders and de determine how tightly they bind to the target. We can then scale up and purify the highest affinity binders from that and really put them through a battery of developability assessments with the Unchained platform. Unchained Uncle platform as being really first and foremost our first test for overall stability of these antibodies. And then once we have all that data, we can then couple that with, say, um, blocking data, as I showed before, to make assessments as to which leads we want to have ahead. So in this case, we picked six final leads based on all that data to push forward potentially into some in vivo studies. So just to summarize, again, the UNCLE platform is a really important part of our overall discovery workflow. And we continue to use many of the other unchained instruments to express, purify, as well as, as well as quantitate our antibody leads as we move them forward in our workflow. And with that, I'd be happy to answer any questions about how the UNCLE platform um, helps in our overall workflow. Thank you very much, Dr. Sato and Dr. Lance. We have had some questions come in. Our first question is for Aaron. Are there minimal TM and tag values that you use as benchmarks for moving antibodies forward? In general, we like to see TM tag from over 60 degrees. And again, that's kind of a bare minimum, but uh, in general, that's kind of our minimal threshold for moving things forward. Thank you. And the next question is also for you, Aaron. What advantages does the UNCLE system have over more traditional instruments, for example, CD, that pharma has used in the past? Yeah, as Kevin showed, um, the Uncle platform has really high throughput, so we can do lots of samples at once. It's also very fast compared to other to more traditional methods of uh, stability assessment. And uh, so overall, and the, the advantage it has is, again, it's really the throughput, as well as the couple of the additional pieces of data that we can, we can acquire as well. So in addition to the stability data, we also get the aggregation data as well. Thank you. And a question for Kevin. You mentioned the system has DLS, but also mentioned the system uses SLS for aggregation. How would DLS be useful for this kind of analysis? So DLS kind of has a couple different features I'd like to talk about. So first of all, besides just the typical size and size distribution that you can get from DLS, 
the way that uncle does DLS for the average, you know, for the, the most common use is to do it at the start and the end of a, of a TMT ag run. So in this case, you're kind of answering two different questions. One is, uh, am I starting with a good monodisperse kind of happy sample that I know I can trust the answers on? Because if your, your initial DLS shows that you have aggregates uh, in the uncle, then you kind of uh, know that maybe that TMT ag data isn't going to be something that you can hang your hat on. And then second, at the end of a run, when Uncle does TMT ag again, it takes, you know, it gives it an orthogonal look at the SLS data. So you can kind of do two things there. You can confirm aggregation if the SLS saw aggregation during the run, or you can just take a second look and see, hey, has my size changed in a way that you know, maybe the SLS didn't give me the full picture on? So that's, that's kind of why we have both light scattering systems in there is because they give you two different pieces of information. Uh, in addition, you can also just do pure DLS with a thermal ramp as well and track DLS size change uh, over a thermal ramp and look at aggregation that way. Excellent. Thank you. And going back to Aaron, how do the TM and TAG values for VHH FCS compared to that of full-length IgGs? In general, VHH single-domain antibodies have lower TM, TAG than uh, full-length antibodies, and again, because they lack the larger complementary structure of an antibody. But you can engineer them to be very stable. There are good examples in literature where you can see TMs well above 60 degrees for um, VHH domains. So great question, but as I indicated, normally VHHs have lower stability. And this question also for you, Aaron. Have you done thermal stability analysis on single domains as well? Yeah, it's kind of a redundant question. Yeah, again, the, the whole library that I just showed is a, is a single domain library, so all the analysis that we did was for single domains. All right, getting down through the list here. This one is for Kevin. Could UNCLE be used for screening binding of proteins and small molecules? Yeah, so that's actually sometimes called a thermal shift assay. And if you're looking at a, a protein that has intrinsic fluorescence and a small, mo small molecule, you can combine both of those and see if the binding of a small molecule and a protein stabilizes that protein's unfolding. So you'd see an a increase in the TM. So this is a you know, pretty commonly done technique for, for screening binding interactions. And it's actually kind of nice because it's, it's one of the only techniques that doesn't require any kind of surface adsorption or conjugation with a dye or anything like that. All right. Thank you. This question is for Aaron. What's the capacity for high throughput antibody expression? Yeah, so our current capacity is we're, we're shooting for you know, doing batches of 100 at a time. But we're going to, in the future, lean to seeing if we can make you know, maybe thousands of antibodies per month using our platform. Thank you. Another question for you, Aaron, from Andrew. From the 141 strong binders to 30 scale up purified VHHFC, was that done in a 96 well plate format? The initial batch of VHH antibodies were made in the plate format, but then when we scaled them up for the larger analysis, we did them in a 10 mil scale. All right. Do you express all 141 binders and then found the top 30 to move on to the follow-up characterization by UNCLE? Yeah, that's exactly what we do. So we make, we do make hundreds of antibodies. And we do the initial analysis using for looking for an affinity, and then we uh, go through the larger analysis, look at developability with the Unchained UNCLE platform. With that, I would like to thank our presenters for today, Dr. Aaron Sato and Dr. Kevin Lance. I would like to thank the folks at Unchained Labs for sponsoring today's web symposium. And I'd like to thank most of all those of you who came and spent this time with us. We're very grateful that you chose to be with us in the midst of your busy day. And we hope we were able to provide some answers that will make life a bit easier for you in the laboratory going forward. So with that, on behalf of Cambridge Health Tech Institute Global Web Symposia Series, I would like to thank you so much for attending. I look forward to seeing you at future CHI Global Web Events. Thank you again so much, and have a great day.